what a historic moment. Rishi Sunak, the first ever oligarch prime minister, elected by the... Oh, hang on a moment. We didn't. He was just appointed again. We've had a prime minister foisted on us whom not a single one of the supposed electorate chose. And not just any prime minister, an oligarch, the richest man in the House of Commons by a very long way. And it's very clear from everything he has done in politics and out of politics where his loyalties lie. They lie with oligarchs like himself. He is the oligarch's oligarch. Two sources of Sunak's money. One of them is the hedge funds. One he set up is based in the Cayman Islands, a notorious tax haven part of whose business is channeling money away from the very budget that he was in charge of. The other source is the vast amount of money that his wife acquired as a result of being the daughter of an Indian tech billionaire and together their fortune is valued at 730 million pounds. Twice that of King Charles's. His wife, Akshata Murti, benefited from the non-domiciled laws. Even though she was living in this country, she was able to avoid, on some estimates, 20 million pounds of tax. That's 20 million pounds that could have gone into public services. And all that happened while he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. We could see this as the consummation of the plutocratic capture of our politics. This man, worth 730 million pounds is now telling the poor how they should live. Informing them with great regret, unfortunately we can't find any more money for you. You're gonna to have to suffer real terms cuts. You might not be able to afford the rent. You might not be able to afford the bills. You might not be able to afford to eat, but we're going to cut the miserable stipend you're entitled to even further in pursuit of our grand programme of enriching people like myself even more than we have already been enriched. That's the message that our new Prime Minister is giving to the rest of the nation, that we can't support public services. Public services in such a desperate state that according to head teachers, 90% of schools in England will by next year be in the red. They will have run out of money. The National Health Service itself is falling apart. Emergency services are collapsing. GP services are collapsing. The waiting times for operations, even people with cancer, whose cancers are spreading, have been growing longer and longer. Doctors and nurses have been leaving the service in droves. There are simply not enough people, not enough beds to support the needs of patients. And that is the result of 12 years of conservative austerity on top of the absolute catastrophe of New Labour's private finance initiative, which is still sucking money out of the service in interest payments to private corporations. You put all that together, and you see that our essential public services have already been cut not just to the bone but into the bone, that they are not coping, they are falling apart. And now Sunak wants to inflict billions of pounds more cuts on those services. Austerity is not a necessity. Austerity is a choice. It could be entirely avoided. We are swimming in wealth in this country. There is a massive surfeit of wealth, but it is highly concentrated in the hands of people like Rishi Sunak and his chums. The very rich, the ultra-rich, the oligarchs. Tax just a small amount of that tremendous wealth and there'd be no need for any cuts at all. In fact, we could massively reinvest in public services. So there's a straightforward choice here. You either take a bit of money away from the ultra-rich or you take everything away from the poor. And Sunak has left us in no doubt about which decision he has made. Over the past 12 years, we've had a succession of disastrous prime ministers. David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and now Rishi Sunak. They're all among the very last people you would want running this country. The worst possible people at the worst possible time. All of them are committed to the very rich and committed against the very poor. All of them seem determined to drain public services of money and put that money into the pockets of those who need it least, the richest people of all. 
Now, you might have imagined, with the massive, humiliating collapse of Liz Truss's premiership, that that whole neoliberal agenda would be finished, and so you would hope. But there's another reading of it, which is that, well, the markets didn't accept her proposals, so we must pay even greater homage to the markets than before. We must ensure that nothing any politician does interferes with what the markets want. We must bow down before finance and give it everything it demands. And so while Liz Truss's version of neoliberalism, these massive unfunded tax cuts, might have been thrown out, the broader structure of neoliberalism, that we demote democracy and put money in their place, that, in many ways, has been reinforced. The situation we find ourselves in is that the bankers, the financiers, the unelected technocrats have even more power over our lives than they did before. And none of us put them there. None of us consented to this. I see this country as a democracy in name only. We have the structures of democracy, houses of parliament, general elections, but power has been shifted out of those structures and into places where the people can't reach it offshore tribunals and indeed offshore capital. It's been shifted into sofa cabinets and decisions made behind closed doors. It's been shifted into a place where we can't choose who the Prime Minister is or have any say at all over their policies until the next election, whereupon our choice is basically reduced to the lesser of two evils. This is a democracy in the weakest and thinnest possible sense of what a democracy might be. I think it's fair to say that three people, none of whom are domiciled in the UK for tax purposes, Rupert Murdoch, Lord Harmsworth and Frederick Barclay, exercise more sway over this government's decisions than the 67 million people who live here. And through their newspapers, the Daily Mail, The Sun and The Times, The Telegraph, those proprietors, those offshore oligarchs, are more powerful than the entire population of this country. Keir Starmer has done more or less what Tony Blair did, which is to launch a great charm offensive towards the billionaire press and big business in order to try to win them over. And there's a cost to that. The cost is that he can't pursue the policies that the electorate might want, because those policies are directly at odds with what the billionaires want. You can't serve both masters. Either you are on the side of the billionaires or you're on the side of the people. And if you're on the side of the billionaires, you have to be against the people. I understand that Starmer wants to get elected. And I understand that in this country, which is so dominated by elite concerns, it's very hard to be elected if you don't have the billionaire press on your side. But if you get elected by sucking up to the billionaire press and giving it everything it wants, then you become barely distinguishable from your opponents. We urgently need a general election. It's ridiculous that we've had two prime ministers now foisted upon us, each with their own policies, without any say for the people whatsoever. But a general election is not enough. It can't end there. We also desperately need a massively revamped political system. We need proportional representation. We need devolution of power to the lowest possible level so that people have as much say over their own lives as they can. We need our representative democracy tempered with participatory, deliberative democracy so that we can be far more involved in fine-grained decision-making. We need to break up the power of the billionaire press. We need to dethrone the oligarchs who have come to control this country. We need to rethink who we are and where we stand. So how do we get this, given that Keir Starmer is hostile to almost that entire agenda? Well, the key change, I think, is proportional representation. Because until we get proportional representation, we just have this perpetual choice of the lesser of two evils. And that choice can constantly be gamed by the billionaire press, by big business, and all the other moneyed interests which are against the general interests of the population. With proportional representation, regardless of the will of the bigger parties, we can start building alliances to pursue the particular policies that we want. We can show the big parties that they can easily be dethroned by alliances of smaller parties which will deliver the policies we want unless they listen to us. What proportional representation would give us 
is a means of exercising citizen power, is a means of putting pressure on political parties that we don't possess today. We must combine in unprecedented numbers to demand the changes we want to see, to demand that we are no longer governed by oligarchs, to demand a democracy rather than a plutocracy, to demand that the politicians who claim to represent us stop representing big capital and listen instead to the people. The mainstream media has been a big part of this problem because they have effectively reduced themselves to reporting on court gossip. We at Double Down News try to go way beyond that, to see the substance behind the spectacle. Please support us by becoming a member and subscribing via Patreon.